How's everybody doing? Is everybody really pumped up to talk about enterprise software? Good. That's what you want to do today. Um, so uh, I'm Aaron Levy, CEO, uh, co-founder of Box, and, um, and what uh, what I wanted to do was share a little bit about our story at, at Box and uh, how we started building our company. We actually didn't start as uh, an enterprise software company. We eventually changed our business model and our, our path, but I um, want to talk a little bit about how we got to uh, uh, that decision and how we uh, started building up our, our product and our company, and then um, if... Uh, and I really hope this is true. If many of you uh, uh, go out and build enterprise software companies, maybe there's some lessons uh, that uh, we've learned uh, that, uh, that took us a long time to learn that maybe you can learn a little bit faster because of, of some of the things that we've gone through. So and then I think with some time, uh, we can open up for, for questions or whatnot. So is that all cool? We good with that? Okay, this is going to be highly interactive. So if we're talking, we've got to like, talk to each other. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Okay, good. Okay. So, uh, I love it when the least interactive part is when I call out that we need to be interactive. But um, okay, so uh, here's how we have been building for the modern enterprise and, uh, and maybe some lessons uh, that you can take with you. So we started in, uh, Box in 2005. And, um, and we were uh, actually um, sophomores and, and freshmen in college at the time when the idea got started. So this was about 12 years ago. And, um, and what was happening was um, everywhere that, that we were working from, everywhere that we were trying to access files from, everywhere that we were trying to share, uh, or anybody we were trying to share data with, it was just way too hard to do this. So uh, we had to have uh, these uh, uh, USB thumb drives. Hopefully you've never had to use one before. Uh, you have USB thumb drives, you're emailing yourself files, you have FTP accounts, and it was just way too complicated uh, for just getting daily work done. Just way too uh, slow, too cumbersome. And um, at the time, I actually did an internship with a company that, that also used uh, enterprise software uh, for sharing and collaborating and managing content. And that technology was also way too complicated uh, and complex. And so this is back in, um, uh, really, we got the idea in kind of late 2004. And what was happening was we saw this confluence of major technology trends that we felt could go and solve this problem of why is it so hard just to share files and get work done with other people? And so we saw that that there would be a handful of major technology trends that could ultimately solve this problem of working with our information, working with our data from anywhere. And so the big three, though, that we focused in on uh, was uh, what were, were the, the first was um, mobile ubiquity. And, uh, and now, obviously, this is, this is a standard trend. No, no software company would start without a mobile strategy. But back in 2004 and 2005, it wasn't the, the case. But we had this vision. Uh, and we had this foresight where we thought back in 2004 and 2005 that over the next decade, the entire planet would start to be using Blackberries everywhere. So um, uh, that was our vision. And um, so we were wrong, uh, fortunately. Um, uh, we got better devices. Uh, but we knew that, that mobile was, uh, uh, was certainly going to be a really powerful uh, opportunity in the future and was going to change the way people worked with information. So we're glad that uh, it ended up being a little bit of a better platform. We also saw this trend of, of uh, the cost of computing and the cost of storage was dropping pretty rapidly. So it wasn't called cloud, uh, cloud computing at the time, um, but you could see that, that there was this ability to buy lots and lots of infrastructure at scale, centralize it in one place, and then be able to build applications on it over the internet. And so uh, we, we sort of figured, why is it that people are going out and building their own infrastructure and their own data center when a software provider could do this all themselves and, uh, and get the economies of scale to, to serve lots and lots of customers with that technology. So, um, so we, we said, OK, at, at, at some point in time, uh, computing is going to reach this point where it's really, really cheap and inexpensive for anybody. And so thus, it should be in the cloud. And then finally, we, we figured that as more and more people were connected to the internet, as more and more people and businesses were working on mobile devices and collaborating more and more, that, that we'd become much more interconnected. And so, businesses uh, that once had to have all of their own uh, people and infrastructure and competencies, competencies within their own organization would eventually be able to be networked with partners and clients and vendors and colleagues all around the world and be able to get value from everyone, which would mean that you'd need software that would be better at letting us interact with one another over the internet as opposed to just people within our own corporate network, uh, which is where the, our, our market had traditionally uh, kind of been focused on. And so we took these three big trends, everybody on the internet, everybody on mobile, and really, really cheap computing and storage. And we said, what would we design if those uh, conditions were true in the future? What would we design to build a really, really simple way for people to share files, 
uh, and securely access their information. And so we, we launched this thing. It was actually called Box.net at the time. And um, we, uh, we, we launched this, uh, this site. And, um, and the idea was really simple. You could upload your files, and you could access them from, from any web browser or any uh, mobile device. And within a few months of launching, thousands of people were signing up for it. And we, we had um, uh, worked on some mechanics to make sure that was as simple as possible. So we had way easier sign-up flow. It was just focused on the end user. So um, in traditional IT environments, you usually had to go to corporate IT or you had to go to corporate security to be able to get access to technology. We just let anybody sign up uh, with their own information, their own email address, which was actually pretty disruptive at the time to traditional IT. So anybody could go online. They could get uh, a couple gigabytes of, of storage space and be able to share and access their information from anywhere. And that was the uh, original idea. And what we, what we sort of ultimately realized that we actually had no clue about, because we were just in college at the time, was that, that Enterprises all around the world and companies of all sizes were just used to really, really bad technology. And the bar was just really, really low for what you could do to, our, our first application was, was pretty horrendous, but the bar was so low that all you had to do was solve some basic problems and then end users within those IT environments, within those enterprises, would all of a sudden want to adopt your technology. And, uh, and so what we discovered was that people all around the world in companies of all sizes, whether it was a Fortune 500 company that was spending hundreds of millions of dollars on technology or small businesses, everybody had this uh, interest and demand for really, really simple tools. So one of our competitors at the time, the, the primary product you had to use for, for sharing information um, looked a little something like this. This is a, a screenshot from one of the products. Um, and uh, and it's, it's you know pretty horribly designed technology. This is um, I don't know even what it says. It's, it's uh, just a screen grab from the internet, but like really not elegant software uh, for, for working with other people and collaborating. And so what, what sort of started out for us as a really simple way to share files, it was like that dead simple of a proposition, actually turned out that it was the, the, the sort of crux of how people could be working um, in the future. And it was a much easier way for people to be able to, to work. And so we... Um, you're getting a little security prompt. Of course, that has to happen. OK. So, um, so what, what started out as a really simple way to share files uh, turned into this new way of working. And we actually had, we weren't trying to solve like, this vast problem of how could companies work in a modern way. All we were trying to do was build really simple technology that makes it easy for people to share files and access information from anywhere. And then we eventually evolved the strategy. And so things were growing uh, so, so quickly that, um, that we basically decided, uh, like any classic startup story, we decided to get in a minivan uh, and drop out of college and move to the Bay Area to, to go and build the company. And um, there's always this part in the story where, you know, if you kind of roll back in time, so this was, this was us um, uh, living uh, and working out of a uh, renovated garage. So that thing behind us is actually technically, um, uh, it's a, actually zoned as a garage. Uh, but we were living out of it, so it was actually pretty illegal. But um, uh, but we were we were just the the four uh, founders just going out, and we had all dropped out of college and building out this what we didn't yet fully know was this enterprise software company, but eventually would become a a, a whole enterprise software platform. And it's funny because when you're dropping out, you know what you imagine, uh, you know the the glory of of okay, I'm I'm leaving school. This is going to be you know, so glorious. You know, think about all the people that dropped out before us. You have Bill Gates. Um, you know, Bill Gates dropped out. This is going to be so exciting. And, and then you've got Steve Jobs, and he dropped out, and this is super exciting. And Michael Dell dropped out, and that's super exciting. But, um, but nobody ever really remembers this guy. And, um, <laughs> and so we're, we're all, we always sort of think about the glorious stories of dropping out. But uh, uh, actually, I don't even know if this guy dropped out. But uh, it just it looks like he must have um, or had to do something. But, but, <laughs> but you know, we, we were so pumped. We were like, we're dropping out of college. Like, you know, fuck this, and uh, we're going to go start an, uh, a software company. And, um, and we were in this position where uh, we were living and working and, and um, uh, all together, and we were iterating on our business over and over again. We, had, um, we were, you know, pivoting almost every single day. So if you've ever done a startup, you know, what you, what you find is, like, maybe every 24 hours you're sort of reflecting on your business model and your strategy and is it going to work and do you think it's going to scale and is this, are the economics actually going to play out? And so we got to this juncture where uh, we basically had to say, do we want to be uh, a company that serves consumers or do we want to be a company that serves businesses? And the reason that we got to that juncture was we had consumers 
that were spending, I think at the time, I think our, the most you could spend on our product was $9.99 a month. So you know, pretty standard consumer software um, uh, uh, payment structure. Um, and it was, it was about 10 bucks a month. But what we saw was that companies like Google and Facebook and Apple and Microsoft eventually would be giving everybody free storage on the internet and that you really wouldn't want to be spending money uh, for, for storage on the internet. And let's maybe just as a quick survey, who, who actually uh, pays for more storage in one of the, the storage solutions that you're using? Maybe we can get a, oh wow, okay. All right, you guys just create a lot of data or something? What's going on here? All right, um, uh, so okay, who doesn't pay? Let's just see the, okay, right. So not a great business model when, when you only have about maybe 35% uh, or so of the market that, that's willing to upgrade for, for your solution. You want to be able to, to, to reach a broader population than that. So what we said was, at some point, Google, Facebook, and others were going to give away unlimited space, and that it was going to be really, really hard to upsell people over time. So that was on the consumer side. On the enterprise side, though, what we realized was, actually, companies were spending millions and millions of dollars on software that that we thought we could do with, with you know, at a far uh, uh, a smaller amount of, of spend and for a, a fraction of the price. So companies on one hand were spending millions or tens of millions of dollars, and we thought we could deliver it to them for maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars. So you could have almost a, a 10 or 20x improvement on, on sort of the cost of, of the service. On the other hand, we felt that, that at most we could charge consumers maybe $10 per month, and, and that would actually have downward pressure over time just because of the, the economics of the space where storage is getting cheaper. So you know, it actually took us a surprising amount of time to come to the conclusion that we needed to go into the enterprise, because we, we still were like, well, yeah, but, but what, if, what if we could you know, serve advertising on the files or something? And it just turns out you, know, you really don't want to see ads when you're looking at your, your, you know, your, your tax documents or your, your photos. Um, uh, and so, uh, so we didn't think that the advertising model was going to work for consumers, um, but, uh, but we did decide that that actually, if you could build really, really great enterprise software that could solve all of the enterprise's problems around managing information and collaborating around files, and you could build one platform for being able to do that, that maybe you could actually compress some of the economics in the market and be fairly disruptive to the, the traditional players. But we sort of stepped back and we said, OK, if we're going to do this, um, like, are we really going to build an enterprise software company? We were 23 and 22 at the time, uh, the, the founding team, and we had a few other em employees. But, but it, you know, it's really like there's actually like there's like a long list of things that you could do that aren't very cool. Like somewhere near the bottom of that list, when you're 23 and 22, is starting an enterprise software company. So like, like literally, like we, we, we like if you just had like a quadrant, you did like a McKinsey quadrant of like like lamest things possible to do. It's starting an enterprise software company. So, so we were pretty, um, we were pretty uh, 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 sort of distraught of this idea of like, are we really going to go and build a, a company like an Oracle or an SAP or something? Is that really going to be fun? Because think about what what we think about when I say, I mean, like like when I say the words enterprise and B two B, you know, what you should be thinking of. Um, if, you, if you have some experience in the space, is you should be thinking like, okay, it's like slow companies that don't innovate quickly. The technology is way too expensive. Like you're just selling to the, to, to the buyer. You're not really selling to the user. Uh, the technology itself is super complex. Uh, so there's really no incentive structure to make really simple enterprise software. The reason for that is that because the people who have the budget don't actually have to deal with the complexity of the technology. So they don't actually prioritize simplicity and user experience when they're making buying decisions. Um, you have all this, like, you have to deal with like frustrating sales reps. So if you're on the other end of buying enterprise software, what ends up happening is you're just getting called all day long by sales reps and, and for software that you basically don't want. Um, there's unfriendly uh, sort of policy terms. So it's always uh, uh, sort of terms of services that, that favor the vendor, not favor the customer. So the very structure of the contracts uh, in this industry uh, are totally not favorable to the co client. Um, software design is pretty horrible because, again, if you don't have a market that is prioritizing user experience or simplicity, then uh, you can't get the best designers because the best designers don't want to work at companies that aren't building really simple software. Uh, and so then, what's the point of having um, uh, what's the point of having you know great design? And so then the design ends up sucking. Um, you get really infrequent updates. So it turns out when you sell to enterprises, this actually makes sense. Enterprises want a lot of predictability. 
they don't want their technology changing on them at the same rate that you know, Snapchat or Facebook is able to change their software for us. Because if I'm a, a CIO, a chief information officer of a 20 or 50,000 person company, and my software vendor is changing all the time, that's going to make it so I have to go retrain my employees. And so what that then that means is that the vendors, the software vendors, don't want to update their software and don't want to update their technology a lot because the customers want it to be infrequently updated. And so that then slows down all of your innovation. Imagine working at a company where you ship product updates maybe once a year or once every three years. That's pretty annoying, so you're not going to get the best innovation. Um, you have all this downtime just because it's like really creaky technology that, that always has like these weird problems that you run into, corrupted data. So like these are the things, if you, and the list could be about five times longer if you were to make a list of like what words describe the enterprise software industry. This is just sort of getting started. And it all sort of come, if you kind of took it all together and, and you sort of rounded it all together, basically like the picture that people have in their head when you say enterprise software uh, is basically like this. It's just... It's just your vendor just being angry at you. Actually, it looks a little bit more like this. It's a little bit more pirate oriented. Um, and, and this is basically what enterprise, uh, enterprises think of when they think of enterprise uh, uh, software companies and when they think about enterprise technology vendors at least 10 years ago. So we said, OK, if we're going to pivot the company and we're going to forego all the, con all the fun and all the exciting times we would have as a consumer company, then we have to we have to find a way to build an enterprise software company that operates and acts and innovates and moves like a, a consumer company. If we're going to forego the, 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 the consumer side and, and serving just uh, consumers in, in their personal lives, we still have to find a way to build a company that, that feels like a consumer company that just happens to sell to enterprises. And so then we made a list of basically what are the things that are changing in the technology world that allow for you to build a company in a very different way. And this is, I think, what makes enterprise software so exciting for all of us today, uh, which is why I, I think it's a, it's, it might not be like still the number one coolest thing to do of all time, but it's, it's at least getting in like the top 300 options. So, so we said, OK, if we're going to build a different enterprise software company, what is, what is true today? And this is back in 2006 and 2007. What is true uh, in 2006 and 2007? that allows us to build a different kind of enterprise software company? Well, the first is let's look at the old way. So the old way was you had really complex technology. It was all about the sales uh, was your distribution channel. So you had to have salespeople as your primary way into getting into customers because, because customers couldn't access your technology on their own. They had to install it. To install it, you had to have a salesperson go out and try and pitch the, the customer that they should uh, start using it. And so, so every, all of your distribution was constrained by the number of sales reps that you had. Um, it was, technology was only available to the biggest companies, uh, and so this ends up being a pretty big flaw because um, if you're trying to go mass have a massive impact on the world, but only the Fortune 500 can actually afford to use your technology because nobody else has the infrastructure um, or the apparatus to be able to, uh, to, serve uh, to, to be able to install the technology, then really you're not having that big of an impact on the world. You're just having a big impact on the top uh, enterprises that, that are out there. Um, we, uh, we, we saw a lot of flaws with how technology sort of solved the security problem. So when you buy enterprise software 10 years ago, you bought, uh, you bought the infrastructure or the hardware, then you bought software, then you bought security software to secure the software and the hardware. And so, bless you. And so you had all of this technology that you had to have buy from lots of different vendors, and it was the customer's responsibility from putting it all together. And so that meant that there was a lot of security vulnerability inside of those, uh, those platforms. There's also a, a thing where the customer is bearing the risk. Because what happens is the customer is buying the licenses for the software up front, regardless of what they use. And so you have this sort of asymmetry where the vendor always wins, because the customer is buying the software in, in perpetuity, essentially. And, um, and, and, and then what's happening is even if the software doesn't work for them, you, the customer is already paid. So you'd, you'd see all the time you'd have these software projects that enterprises would have where they'd spend $10 million on software and they'd never install it because it wasn't what they wanted. And there's no recourse. They, once they bought it, they can't do anything about it. So, so pretty fundamental uh, 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 broken business model. Uh, and then finally, um, the platforms themselves were fairly proprietary. So they were closed systems. They, they weren't integrated and open to other platforms. Um, and so it was very proprietary technology. And so we said, well, what if there's a new version of each of these things? What if you could make it so the technology was simple and elegant, and we always focused on the end user, and we never lost sight of the power of the end user. What if the product 
was actually pulled into organizations by those end users, as opposed to you having to only do tops down sales? What if the software was so good and so freely available that anyone could bring it into the workplace on their own? What if it was available to people uh, uh, inside of organizations of all sizes. What if it could be a small business anywhere around the world? What if it could be a large enterprise? What if it could be a three-person startup? So how could you make that technology available to anybody of all size? Um, how could you make sure that security was baked in so the customer doesn't have to buy all this other technology and wrap it around these tools? What if the vendor could bear more of the risk? So if, if you're a customer of ours and the technology is not working, you're not going to renew. So what if more of that risk to making sure you're successful is actually something that the vendor has to focus on. And then finally, what if you had open systems? What if you connected to all the different enterprise software that people were using and you didn't have a closed platform that locked in data? So, so we kind of said, OK, there's this old way that, that the oracles of the world built their technology. And then there's a new way. And what if we could go describe each of these new things that was different about technology today and, and go build an enterprise software company that, that really solved this core set of issues? And, and that's essentially what, what we've been working on for the past decade. So we said, here are the new conditions of, of, of this landscape. Let's build a software company for the enterprise that is built and operates like a consumer company. Uh, and that is, that's been our, our strategy um, uh, since about 2007. And uh, unfortunately, uh, what's cool is, is that it uh, 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 has you know, played out um, in favor of a lot of the things that, that, that we've been talking about or that we identified. So we now have about 71,000 customers. We're in about 63% uh, of the Fortune 500. And this was generated mostly because people just at work wanted to bring in better technology. And then we eventually were able to sell to the broader organization. But it was really about solving for that user pulling the technology into the workplace, and then ultimately solving a, a bunch of problems from there. And, uh, and, and the exciting thing about um, uh, uh, what has played out in the cloud is that you have companies of all sizes and in all industries that are now um, uh, transforming the way they work because of, of the cloud. And so um, we can work with uh, companies as wide ranging as Pixar, uh, where they uh, use Box to be able to share and collaborate around movies to Nike, uh, where uh, they uh, uh, use Box for you know, product and, and marketing, all the way to um, Eli Lilly, where uh, you have things like R&D and drug discovery and, um, and, and, uh, and various uh, kind of medical discoveries happening um, and collaborating around uh, uh, through Box as well. So, so what's cool is it doesn't matter the industry. Companies of all sizes have realized all of this potential uh, from moving to the cloud. And, and we are one of many companies that are benefiting um, from, this, uh, from this set of trends. And the cool thing, I think, for, for all of us and, and uh, for anybody starting a company in this space is that really this is just the beginning of, of a whole uh, significant change in this industry. So um, you know, going back 10 years, it, I thought it was the beginning, but it was still a pretty slow start to kind of get to where we are today. But if I look at, at all of the trends that are happening in the enterprise, I think the, the, the sort of best um, uh, opportunities are actually yet to come. And uh, so this means that there's going to be more growth and more opportunity than ever before. And the reason for this is basically you have two, you have two big factors. First is most of the technology still used by enterprises is, is still that legacy technology. It's still old. It's slow. It's complex. It's expensive. It's sold by the legacy vendors. And so on one hand, you just have this gigantic market of old stuff that is going to have to get retired, shut down, and move to the cloud. That's the first thing. But the other trend is that every business on the planet is recognizing that that legacy technology is not going to let them transform their business models, the way that they serve their customers, the way that they operate. And uh, you, you probably, uh, you, you're probably familiar with the fact that every single company on the planet at this point knows they need to modernize their, their organization in some significant way. So if you're a media company, you're freaking out because of Netflix. If you're a life sciences company, you're freaking out because of 23andMe. If you're a financial services company, you're freaking out because of Stripe. If you're a hospitality company, you're freaking out because of Airbnb. And so every single company in every single industry recognizes that you have all of these disruptive forces coming from the digital uh, industries and, uh, and you know, Silicon Valley and, broad, and, and broader than, than Silicon Valley, and that every single company is going to have to operate and upgrade both the technology that they use as well as the, the sort of business models that they have. And what's cool is if you're building for enterprises, that means there's an unbelievable amount of opportunity because all of those companies 
all the Fortune 500 and all the other companies that need to be transforming are going to need modern software to be able to, to work and, and, uh, and operate in this new way. They're going to need new technology that allows them to be able to actually compete effectively uh, with, uh, with the digital uh, uh, economy. So that means uh, for, for all of us that there's more opportunity than, than ever before. Uh, because uh, if I go back 10 years ago, there wasn't actually a significant catalyst for enterprises to go upgrade their IT systems and their technology systems. But today, that catalyst is just the fact that, that every company is being disrupted in, in sort of every single way that they, they look at the market. And so that just means that, that you have this catalyst, which is if I am a General Electric, or I'm a Walmart, or I'm a Procter & Gamble, I need to be working with startups and new suppliers that are going to make me more effective and more competitive, which means that then there's opportunity if you're building for, for B2B. So uh, if I can convince you to build an enterprise software company, uh, here are some lessons uh, that we have learned. And a lot of these actually apply probably for most markets. Um, uh, they're ones that, that we've specifically taken uh, from building for the B2B market, but, um, uh, but certainly a lot of these apply whether you're building a, a consumer app or a medical device company or, or, uh, or any kind of um, uh, entrepreneurial activity. But, but here are sort of, I think, eight lessons that we've taken from our journey and a few that, that, that I've learned from other companies over the years as well um, that I'll, I'll try and weave in. So, um, uh, so some of the things that we've been thinking about. The first is, um, and this one we, we has been just the foundational way that we got started, which is um, start with something insanely simple and, uh, and then focus on expanding it over time. And we, when we got started, um, I, I, if, you were, if you were in enterprise IT or you worked at one of our competitors like a Microsoft or a SAP or an Oracle and you looked at our software, you literally would have died laughing. You would have, you would have looked at our technology and you would be like, that is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Like all it does is you upload a file and then you access the file. And it was, it was that simplicity that was actually why it was so disruptive. Because all of those vendors thought that, that the, the problem was we just need to jam in as many features as humanly possible into one piece of software. And that was, that was correlated with our value proposition. That was sort of how enterprise software companies operated. And so we, we, we just, because mostly because we, we weren't focused on the enterprise, we just took the opposite approach. We said, actually, the fewer features, the, the, the simpler set of functionality in one place is actually going to be our, our value proposition. And if you were in classic enterprise software, you would have looked at our product and you would have thought it was a toy, essentially. You would have been like, that is never going to serve enterprises. It's not going to serve regulated businesses. It's not going to serve complex workflows. And what they didn't recognize was that was just the start. That was just our day one use case. That was the day one thing that we were trying to solve. So uh, the instinct and the tendency, and this, is, this still happens today, like at our company 12 years later when we've learned this, um, I, I think so directly, you still have this tendency. Anybody in this room that goes out and brainstorms, like how can we build a big enterprise software company? You're going to brainstorm by like listing out lots and lots and lots of things. You're going to list out lots and lots and lots of features, like this wish list of what if you could just build all this cool shit. But that's not actually how you're going to be successful. You're going to be successful by nailing one use case that, that just happens to be a use case that everybody has a massive problem with. And if you can nail that one use case, that becomes essentially the wedge to then use to expand out to all the other uh, use cases that you want to go and solve. And so you have to sort of resist the natural instinct, which is that more functionality, more powerful software is better and really make sure that you're focused on one thing that you're going to do better than everybody else. Uh, a great example that, uh, that I've, I've been re-reminded of this over and over from is uh, a company called Gusto um, that was previously called Zen Payroll. And what, what they did was they just said that payroll software and payroll services sucks in, in small businesses, as, as an example. And so they, just, they built a software application that was just about making sure your employees get paid as efficiently as possible. And then eventually, that was so successful, and they got embedded into so many businesses that they could eventually expand to more and more HR services and more and more things that an HR team has to do with their employees. And so, but they started with that one use case, which is let's just get payroll right, make it so successful, so simple, so effective, that then you can build up over time. So again, you have, when starting out, you have to resist the urge to want to build a lot of functionality and really focus on one use case that people are going to be able to easily describe to other people and then be able to go from there. So that's, that's the first lesson. And again, 12 years in, 
we're still having to relearn this over and over again. The amount of product meetings that, that I end up in where we have to be like, we have to remove that feature, we have to hide that thing, we have to make that simpler, it never goes away. Even when you're, you're bigger, you still have to make sure you're really, really focused on keeping things dead simple and almost deceptively um, uh, simple in, in, in what you're actually gonna go and do for the customer. Because it just turns out that, that uh, in these cases, having less functionality gives people way more opportunity than go use your service. Um, and it's, it's counterintuitive, but the more functionality you have, the more you're gonna narrow the set of customers uh, that, that ultimately are gonna be able to, to sort of make sense of your product and wanna use your product. So that's the first thing. Another uh, major factor is, uh, and, and I, you know, I think that, that you, as you're starting your company, you really need to think hard about this one, which is make sure that, that you're benefiting from a major technology tailwind. Um, there are so many companies that get started where there's no particular macro technology trend that, that they're riding on top of. And in some cases, uh, even worse, there, there can be technology trends that you're sort of resisting or that, you, that are sort of points of friction uh, for you. And, uh, and so you really have to think hard about what is going on in the technology landscape that I am going to be able to ride that wave with, with my innovation, where the growth of whatever that technology um, uh, trend is, is something that, that I can then grow alongside. In our case, we benefited from three or four mega trends. We benefited from the growth of mobile. We benefited from the, the lower cost of computing. We benefited from the fact that everybody was, was coming onto the internet. And all three of those trends were disruptive to our incumbents that were selling traditional enterprise software. And so we were able to take these mega trends that we had nothing to do with take these megatrends right on top of them, and they were just an onslaught of, of basically disaster for, for the traditional competitors in the space. So try and find the, what are the technology trends that you think incumbents are not gonna be able to respond well to because they are either, they're, they're sort of economically, strategically, or from a talent standpoint, not able to, to leverage those technology trends in the same way that, that you can. PlanGrid is a, a pretty cool example of this. Um, they basically do software for construction companies and for architecture firms and, and, um, uh, and builders to be able to let you do blueprints and other kind of construction projects on, on the iPad and the iPhone. And, um, and it was, it's a pretty dead simple idea but it's, it's going after just the fact that there's billions of dollars spent every single year on either software that is stuck on your computer or paper-based processes. And they could basically ride the growth of mobile and the growth of mobile in these sort of field worker scenarios to be able to, to, uh, to grow with that. And so they, they nailed the timing perfectly of, okay, it was a couple years after the iPad, now's the time where these devices are gonna start to show up in physical environments what is the software that we need to do to be able to let uh, construction teams and building uh, companies be able to, to use that technology? So really make sure that, that, that you're gonna benefit uh, significantly from a major tailwind and don't create unnecessary headwinds for yourself. Um, your product uh, in a perfect world should really literally sell itself. And this is, again, you know, when you're going out and you're building for the enterprise, instinctively you're not thinking about how can I make the product be that sort of point of viral adoption? Because we're so used to sort of building up sales teams and building up all the, all the sort of customer relationships with our, which are still important because you're still gonna have to use probably sales to ultimately close large deals with clients. But make sure that the product itself is something that can be adopted, spread, and utilized without any friction by the end user. Um, sales really should be used to close big deals, not to drive product adoption. And that's a big distinction in the traditional enterprise software world, where sales was sort of the only way that you could push out product adoption uh, into companies. And so for, in our case, what we did was we made it, um, we, we put a huge emphasis on all of our sharing functionality in Box. So when you had a document that you wanted to share, we wanted to make it really, really, really simple to be able to share those, those files around. So then the software would spread itself as opposed to us having to just keep selling it into companies like the traditional uh, uh, enterprise software vendors were doing. And then you use sales to close bigger deals, essentially, to help, the cus help sort of navigate in that customer environment. Uh, and so Slack today is sort of the perfect quintessential example of a viral enterprise software product where the very usage of the service is to then spread to other people because by definition you're communicating with other people. 
And, and they've, they've really done this uh, extremely well, which is, which is make sure that you're building a product that is as easy to adopt and as viral as possible. Every single thing about that product is tuned for the end user to be able to be empowered to spread it on their own so they can build their own sort of viral distribution channel. Sales then comes in later, and then you can sell additional services or capabilities to that enterprise. And so you really want to have a bifurcation between product adoption and sales uh, sort of uh, 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 making sure that you're, you're doing the bigger deals. Bless you. OK, next one. Spend time, a lot of time, with your sort of futuristic customers, but don't exactly just build what, they, what they're asking for. And so what, what happens when you're building for the enterprise, you're, you will always have, just, just inevitably, you always have a bell curve of, of sort of customers, of, of sort of how uh, uh, innovative or how sort of leaning into the future they are versus how conservative they are. And it's, it's the customers that are sort of at the, the first sort of 5 to 10% of that bell curve. Of, they're at the bleeding edge of everything. These are the people that, that you know, they, they, wait, they wait in line and they get the AirPods and they have an Amazon Alexa like at their desk in their office. Like these are the customers that, that you want to spend a lot of time with because they're going to see things even before you will about how your technology could be used in their environment. They're going to spot trends of what's happening in their employee base uh, that, that, uh, and how they want to push your technology farther than you even would have imagined would, would have been possible. The amount of, of sort of innovation that we've been able to drive because of what we've heard from those customers is probably a significant percentage of what we've ended up building. But the difference is, from en legacy enterprise software companies to today, is back in the day what you would do is you would just ask them, what do you want us to build? And then you'd go build those things because that would essentially lead to a sale or an upsell. What, what, what you need to do is, is listen to what are the issues that they're seeing. What, what are the things they wish your product could do? And then either work with them or come back with solutions that maybe aren't exactly what they asked for, maybe aren't the specific features that they asked for, but are going to eventually get them down the path that, 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 that really they're trying to push your product in. And so we spent a lot of time listening to customers, but not building exactly what they asked for. Because when, when you just build what a customer asked for, essentially you become this sort of amalgamation of feature requests from every single one of your customers. And there's no way that you're going to then be able to keep a consistent North Star with your product. You're going to be sort of pulled in lots of different directions by lots of different customers. But the customers that do, the, the software vendors that do it really wrong is by not listening at all to those early adopters. They start focusing on the most conservative companies. They start focusing on the people that, that will only adopt if they build all of the features that, that they ask for. And that's really how you go wrong in enterprise software, because then you really lose sight of your vision um, and ultimately what you're trying to build. And so we have, um, we have a bunch of different groups that we work with to try and learn uh, all of the, the things that, that the customer um, uh, you know, would, would want. So we have lots of advisory boards, and we're getting lists of hundreds and hundreds of requests. But we don't just go and build whatever those requests are. We spend a lot of time thinking about how can we connect the dots between multiple requests or multiple ideas to build a solution that people didn't really even think about previously. Also, another area where, where software companies go wrong is you're going to get a lot of requests from customers that are sort of contradictory in nature. Somebody in financial services is going to say, I want you know, this functionality for my bank. And then somebody in life science is going to say, I want this functionality for my pharmaceutical company. And you're not going to be able to kind of like actually uh, synchronize those requests. They're going to, be, they're going to uh, fundamentally require different user experiences, different product functionality. And where a lot of software companies go wrong is you start to sort of build all these features in isolation. And then you sort of zoom out five years later, and you've just built this mess of technology that has like, OK, we've got this vertical offering for that, for that industry. And then we've got a separate vertical offering for that industry. You can learn a lot from companies like Salesforce, which essentially said, OK, we're going to build these modular components that can be mixed and matched to create user experiences for different industries, for different uh, lines of business, for different job functions. We're not going to bake in all of the functionality directly into the product. We're going to give customers the tools to, or even our own team to do, the, to do that customization themselves. So a lot of companies get into a trap where you just are mindlessly building lots of features. You sort of zoom out a few years later, and what you have is this mess of serving a whole bunch of different industries with a really, really bad user experience. Um, 
the thing that, that we, we still stayed true to today, and this is where this is, gets harder and harder over time, especially as the deals get bigger and bigger, is making sure that at any juncture, you're not ever trading off the user experience for some enterprise feature or some feature that's gonna get you a bigger deal. There's gonna be hundreds of times where you're at this moment where the customer is asking for something that is antithetical uh, or, or going to go against the, 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 the simplicity of that user experience. Maybe it's a security feature. Maybe it's a compliance feature. Maybe it's something that they're just trying to put in the way of the end user. And at every single one of those decision points we have, we have made sure that we always favor the end user over the enterprise. And in some cases, that means that we'll, we will lose deals. And so we'll have to say no to a customer because by building that feature, we don't think we're going to be able to deliver the delight and the user experience that we're looking for uh, over time. And so that gets really, really painful because you lose then deals all throughout the years. Um, so if I look back over the past 10, 10 years, we've lost tens of millions of dollars of business because we said no to certain customers. What we benefited from, though, was a product that many, many years later could serve a much wider population of, of customers. And that, that ended up making our existing customers much more successful with our product. And, and funny enough, the, the companies that once didn't say yes to us and, and, went th and took their business somewhere else ended up being unsuccessful with those products and had to eventually come back to us. And so if you're right, and the key point here is you have to be right, if you're right, and, and that user trade-off truly was going to be disastrous for that user experience, and you remain true to, to that North Star of always focusing on the user, eventually over the long run, and, and sort of long run can be defined whatever your market is in, you will end up winning in that market over the long run. And so you, but you're gonna lose deals along the way, and that's gonna be really stressful for you, for your team, for investors, but it's really important that you're crystal clear on the principles of how you're building your product and what you're gonna say no to. Finally, um, find ways, and this kind of goes back to that technology trend uh, uh, thing, but try and find ways where uh, you can have asymmetrical uh, uh, or asymmetric um, uh, uh, advantages over, uh, over the competitors. And, uh, and what you'll find is that your competitors, the big incumbents, tend to be locked in pretty significantly to particular business models because they, in some cases, have tens of thousands of employees that are, are built up to build uh, and, and to deliver products in a very specific way. And so if you can find points of differentiation um, and uh, disruption that they can't respond to because, because either it is too expensive for them to respond to or strategically it doesn't make as much sense for them to respond um, or they don't have maybe the talent to respond to it, that is how you ultimately uh, remain disruptive to, uh, to, to these bigger companies. That's the only way to survive uh, as a small startup. Amazon Web Services, you know, we take it for granted now how easily you can build a company and just by writing some, some code and, and uh, deploy it on AWS. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, what, what, what you had to do is you had to buy all these servers, you had to put them in data centers, you had to rack them yourselves, you had to connect them all together, and that would take weeks or months and cost, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars just to get your startup uh, going. But that's the benefit to us as building software companies. Think about now the difference if you're one of the vendors that built that, 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 uh, that hardware and you sold those servers and you sold that data center space. Think about how disruptive Amazon Web Services was coming out of nowhere and, and having a completely different model where now I don't have to buy servers anymore because I can just go to Amazon. Amazon did something that was so disruptive to the core business model of traditional server makers and software providers that, that literally those companies to this day have not even responded. 12 years later, you, they still have not responded by being able to deliver these capabilities over the cloud because of how disruptive it is from a business model standpoint. So really try and identify, are there things from a product standpoint that can be highly disruptive to how your product can be delivered to clients versus how incumbent solutions were delivered. And I, I kind of wrap all of this up with, uh, with a, a Steve Jobs quote. It's sort of, it's a requirement that you have a Steve Jobs quote in any product presentation, so I, I need to meet that quota. But um, uh, uh, th this is really true, and it's especially true in enterprise. It's like really true in consumer, but it's like even more true in enterprise software because what happens is enterprises are just, asking for solutions to all their problems. But in many cases, 
They don't know what the right solution is until you come out of nowhere with something they never thought would be possible. In our case, just in our product, literally, if you took 100 IT people from 100 different companies 12 years ago, and you said, draw out the best way for your company to manage documents, manage files, secure their information, not in 100 attempts would, would our solution have been sort of designed. Because everybody was so used to the technology has to be really complex. It has to be have all these interface buttons. It has to have all these features for it to make sense. We came in with a product that nobody would have anticipated because of how dead simple it was. And, and so you, you can't really go ask your customers just like, hey, what do you want us to do? And then somehow you're going to end up with a really great solution. You have to really think hard about, about what is possible in the future. What are the things that maybe your customers aren't anticipating? And you have to build that. And then, and then essentially um, uh, have that land inside of the customer uh, uh, base. So really make sure that you're not just building what customers are asking for, because no great technology has been built that way. Last thing that I'll leave you with. It's my, um, I think they're my four favorite books on, 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 being, uh, on building B2B stuff, but don't hold me to it. But here are four good books that I would highly recommend reading um, if, uh, if you're going to build a B2B software company. It's all about, it, it sort of gives you in, gets you into the mindset and, and have the frame of reference of, of how to think about growth, disruption, building a new market, and then ultimately going out and building a company that, uh, that can scale in this space. So, so if I had read these four books 12 years ago, um, I think we would have not had to learn these lessons so slowly. Um, so, uh, so I would uh, highly recommend uh, checking these out. So with that, uh, I would just say uh, good luck. Please do not compete with me. Um, uh, I don't need more competition. Do not use my advice against me uh, in any way. And, uh, and hope to, to see you in the market. So take care. Okay, and I don't know what happens next, but, uh, but I have time. I have like five minutes, but I don't know how it works with people. Okay, okay, I can answer questions, or you can leave. Either way. Okay. Yes. Um, so, what are some ways that you would actually suggest us to find out this pain point in this large company? Because similar to you, when you were actually back in school. We yeah may not have had, had a chance to work in all these large companies. Yeah. What are your take on that? Yeah, it's, it's hard because I, I, I haven't had to do what, what you're asking, um, which is, and the question was, um, how, do you, how do you discover issues that enterprises are having without necessarily working inside the enterprise? Um, you know, I think one is spend a lot of time with, with people that, that, that every day they're going into the, to the office and they're running into all these problems. And I would just go interview like 100 people. Just like, walk me through your day. What are all the places where you are are less effective, less efficient, having to do repetitive or redundant work. And, and don't ask for technology problems. Just listen to where they're spending their time. And what, is, what, what processes do they keep repeating over and over again? And then you can kind of start to imagine, well, how could software go and attack that problem? How could software attack the problem of you know, meeting scheduling? Not a big market, but, but one, one space. How could software attack the problem of, of, of payroll? How could software attack the problem of expense reporting, all these kind of things are the drudgery of, of working inside of a big company. But, but if, you're not, if you haven't worked in one of those big companies, you at least have to get as much information as you can from people that, that do work in those big companies. And then you can kind of start to see patterns of like, OK, this seems like a really big problem. And in our case, if you, if you had interviewed uh, clients uh, or people that worked in big enterprises 15 years ago, and you'd said, walk me through your day, I think you, you would have eventually spotted how much time is wasted when people are working with their documents and they're trying to share their documents and they're trying to access their documents from different devices. If you really peeled it apart and you asked all the right questions, you would have actually discovered this problem. We discovered it because of, of what we were doing in our personal lives at, in college, but you would have also discovered it by just understanding where are people spending time in the workplace and then saying, hey, wait a second, that doesn't make sense because technology today could solve that problem way better than what they're, they're getting as solutions. And so you can just find, as soon as you find that, that gap, that's where you know you can build a company. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, like you mentioned about uh, driving the tag weight. What, in your opinion, what do you think is the biggest tag weight now? Mm. Um, well, it's not Bitcoin. So um, sorry uh, to all the Bitcoin startups. Um, uh, I mean, it might be Bitcoin could be up in the top, you know, five or something. But but uh, you know, I don't want to offend all the Bitcoin people. So um, I'm gonna get like hate mail. Uh, can that? Can we edit that part out um, about my attack on Bitcoin? Um, so, um, 
Uh, you know, the, I'm going to say a bunch of the, the trends. I actually I don't know how to rank order them, but uh, obviously AR VR is a big one. I think I think AR VR is is it's in a challenging spot because we don't have ubiquitous devices yet, and so the question is: Is AR VR like mobile was 12 years ago, or is it still another five years away? The last thing you want to do is be the mobile startup of 2001, because those startups died. So, so you got and, and, and it's actually really hard to predict these things. So I, I don't have any advice on like how do you predict if it's actually going to happen or not. But there was a bunch of mobile companies, and um, and funny enough, Sam Altman would, would have good stories around this back in like 2004, um, building a mobile company, and um, and how hard it was because you didn't have the iPhone. And so before the iPhone, it really sucked being in mobile. And that's kind of the state of things right now if you're building AR, VR, which is like, we know this is probably the future. We don't know if we're looking at the right era of it yet. So that would be the one caveat I'd just say. It's going to be the future. We don't know exactly when. Um, you know, AI is, is a massive tech trend. It doesn't necessarily benefit, though, startups versus incumbents. It's going to be more pervasive than that. So I don't know how to necessarily use it as an advantage over an incumbent because, because the incumbents are actually like almost superior in, in this technology right now. Um, uh, you, you, let's see. I mean, you can always expect the cost of computing is just going to continue to drop. So like we thought that was a trend 12 years ago. Well, it hasn't gone away. And it's actually more powerful than before, ever before. But I think there's some pretty cool things. Like, like as an example, and it might, we might have to, I might have to change my own even definition of this, of, of like thinking about the compounding of two trends. So for instance, AI and cheap computing together are actually the really powerful trend right now. So um, Google just uh, launched this new service that does um, image recognition and video recognition, object recognition inside of images and videos. So just via an API, you can send Google an image or a video, and it will tell you what's in that, that image or video. So uh, that would have taken like 100 engineers five years ago to go build that. And now you get it as a simple API from Google. So thinking about, wait a second, like what happens when you have a bunch of these new services that are being created on our behalf from Google, Amazon, Microsoft, et cetera, what's the new set of problems that we could use those solutions and build software for? So maybe you build a, a company that does security cameras uh, that plugs in the Google computer vision API. Maybe you build a, a, a new way to navigate or search for, for images and data because of, of these APIs. So like, there's a lot of new problems that, that you wouldn't have even been able to see were a problem before you knew that this technology was possible. And so now you can start to look at the world in a different way if you have kind of complete understanding of what all those APIs are that, that are out there now. Cool, maybe the last question. Oh, yeah. I was wondering what's your opinion on like as a startup using other enterprise softwares on your platform or just building up your own? Um, like what's an example? So I mean, so I guess like servers are pretty obvious yeah. to use, but like for instance, like money transactions, using something for that, yeah. or if you have something specific that maybe could be built versus like. Yeah, I mean, I think there, so. The, the question is, I, I think the question is sort of like, when do you decide what to build and versus what to use other companies for? And I think for us, um, I'm, I'm generally a, uh, I generally believe that anything that that uh, anything that is not your core competency you need to make sure that you're using the best in class outside solution for. Um, and so the moment uh, that, that you realize, I'm not going to be the best company at payments, you, you better be using Stripe or something else for that problem. You, you shouldn't be building that yourself. So, so the last thing you want to do is spend any time as a company building out things that the market is going to solve better uh, uh, than, than you will, and make sure that you are extremely cr clear on your core competency. And I think this is actually where startups go um, uh, sort of the wrong way a lot of times, is not getting crystal clear on what is the thing that we can do that the market is not going to go and build and make uh, and, and commoditize. And what's, what's interesting, and, and, uh, and kind of we've learned this over the years, is that's not a static definition. The market is always changing, and so your core competency might actually be changing, you know, every couple of years because you have to adapt with the realities of the market. If I go back ten years ago or twelve years ago, we had that 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 picture of the four of us. We would go into data centers and we were building out our own storage infrastructure, and and like we knew that it sucked that we were building out our own storage infrastructure because we knew somebody else could be doing this better than us, but there was no other solution. Fast forward to today. We have no problem using Amazon for all of that. We have no illusion that that, somehow, that that is somehow a point of differentiation or value for us. And so the moment that the rest of the market catches up and commoditizes something that you used to be good at, you need to get away from that part of the market as fast as possible. Cool. All right. 
I gotta jump. Good luck, guys. Take care.